In the foothills of the Rocky Mountains of the United States of America, Boulder, Colorado is a city with a well-earned reputation for visionary active transportation. Perpetually at the top of North America's best cities for bicycling lists, Boulder's safe and accessible cycle network is the result of several decades of sustained planning. The progress is impressive, but the work is far from complete. Every street, intersection design, and policy choice is an opportunity to create a more complete all ages and abilities network. We went for a ride with Dave, DK, Kemp, who at the time was a senior transportation planner with the city of Boulder, and Zach Vanderkoy, an integrated mobility advisor with the Dutch transportation planning firm, Mobicon, which opened an office in Boulder in 2022 to take a closer look at how Boulder is taking inspiration from global leaders like the Netherlands, while leading innovations to build its next generation of improvements to its cycling network. And we begin with 13th Street, one of the very first protected bikeways in North America. So we're here in the heart of downtown Boulder, adjacent to our Pearl Street Mall, core of downtown, really uh, active place, a lot of commercial activity, a lot of offices, people living here, really the heart of our city. So DK, what, what is special about this particular bike facility here in the middle of Boulder? Oh, Zach, this is one of my favorite facilities, my, one of my favorite separated bike lanes, AKA protected bike lanes that we have in the city and, and one of my favorite nationally too right now. And it's one of the oldest. It was actually constructed over 20 years ago uh, before the concept of uh, really this merging in the US. And so this was a great way for us to beautify the street with these beautiful planters here. And they also add the bollards of so true protection and then provide cyclists a, uh, a separated path that just goes right down through the middle of the heart of downtown. And this is an example of a protected bike lane, the kind that we're seeing all over North America uh, in different forms and iterations. This one was well ahead of its time. One of those kind of uh, Dutch inspired ideas that's made its way and been adapted in North America. When you get into the business of doing separated bike lanes, you really got to take a look at your your overall budgeting needs and, and factor in what it takes to make sure you maintain these facilities year round uh, because you, you know you, you can't have it part, part of the year because we're really looking to uh, get those cyclists riding all year round. And so making sure that you're working with your transportation maintenance group and bring them in early on the design of some of these projects and let them weigh in. Think about your equipment and then will it be able to fit in some of this, you know, some of these um, dimensions here with uh, your separated bike lanes. And uh, is the equipment that you currently have, is it new, is it old? Is it time to invest in some new equipment that is works better for these special facilities? So really the, you know, it's the, the collaborative nature of creating things like this takes many departments. And we're gonna see as Boulder and a lot of cities are working to build out a complete network that includes all types of facilities like this, uh, off street facilities and all different flavors of bike lanes. Uh, we just want to say it's really great to have something that's really high quality like this, even if it's uh, just in one special place, because this, this really marks downtown Boulder. And I just think I love bringing people here when they come to Boulder because it's just amazing. And it's exactly where it needs to be, right in the middle of our downtown that gets you uh, right to the, the center of the city. That's right. Yeah, this particular facility, you know, really is the, uh, the impetus for how we do things in Boulder. So this is an important part of the overall network. We talk all oh, about yeah. network planning mm -hmm. and, and you know our you have great facilities here and there, but how do they all link together? Well a real important aspect of transportation in Boulder is making sure we've got good north-south connectivity. We've got schools um, on both sides of this corridor right now. And so you have uh, middle school riders who are running south to go north to middle school. You've got the high school, Boulder High School uh, right south of us here. So they're coming from the north. And, and just overall connectivity for the city, you know, being having that north-south is, is really key. Because for the east-west, we've got excellent off-street network uh, connectivity through our multi-use path system. And so when we think about, you know, bridging the gap, coming through one of the busier parts of the city here, it's, it's nice that we've got this separated facility to help people feel comfortable traveling through. Cool. Shall we go take a ride? Let's go ride. Okay. All right. Yeah, what's really nice about this too is this is wide enough for two people to ride side by side. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to really go single file. It's a comfortable facility. Yeah, I do appreciate the width.
Okay, so we're here at Boulder Junction, which is the uh, newest developing part of Boulder. We're actually right in the center of the city. And if you look around us, we see a lot of construction of mid-rise, three and four story residential buildings. Um, and this is exciting for Boulder. This is actually an ambitious uh, attempt to bring more housing into the city. We know we're gonna see growth here. And so if we're gonna be able to have an opportunity to design it the right way, let's do that. And so what this development does here is repurpose some, a lot of big old parking lots. It's a mixed use of office space, residential, and a lot of affordable housing too. So our city has a requirement for each development that there is a portion of that is dedicated to affordable housing. And so what we've done is we've decoupled the parking from home ownership or apartment ownership in this facility. So what's known as the SUM pump principle, shared unbundled managed parking. Uh, that's precisely what this was our first attempt at, at looking at um, you know, how we create a high density, high value, high aesthetic, multimodal transportation place where you don't necessarily have to have a car in order to, to get around the greater region. I like that way of describing it a lot, and we, we talk in Boulder a lot about the tale of two cities, right, because there's, there's the older part of Boulder where we started today near the bus station in downtown that's primarily single-family home, residential, very fine-grain kind of grid network urbanism, mm -hmm. and then we have the other Boulder, which is uh, kind of east of our, our of Folsom, east of 28th Street, where we are now, which is really super block urbanism. You've got, you know, the, the large-scale retail, up until recently, mostly un underutilized parking space. So uh, it's really an exciting way to make a different type of urban environment. Yeah. That's, uh, that's new, but um, equally appealing in different ways. Yeah, uh, yeah it's not hard to imagine uh, how this will feel uh, as a really activated, rich public space uh, when it is fully built out and populated. But when you're making a new neighborhood, you have sometimes an opportunity to make new streets. This is 29th Street, so this is a type of street that actually is based on a lot of experience from the Netherlands. A shared space type of street where all modes are welcome to use this street. But the behavior that's expected is dictated through the design and through a pretty aggressive implementation of speed management. You know, when you have cars traveling at 10 miles per hour, they can share the space with anybody moving at almost any speed safely. And there's, there's very little opportunity for, for uh, uh, safety problems or uh, conflicts. So I like this street as an early implementation of a Dutch principle applied in the North American context. I think we're gonna see more streets like this. They may not look exactly like this. We may learn as we go. We talk a lot about harmonizing uh, design and function uh, so that the design of the street should match the way you want it to, to work. To make this work as a, as a shared street where, where, where car speeds are very, very low, one of the key features is that it's actually at a, a level design with the sidewalk. So there's no real distinction between car space, pedestrian space, and bike space. It's everyone working together, uh, negotiating that. There's some really good uses of texture. You see some rough bricks and pavement on the ground. Um, that, only, that not only has a water, a water uh, management function, it also helps provide some texture, some friction on the road that you feel that helps tell you intuitively that this is a place to go slow. You see some signs here in a, maybe the truest, purest implementation of this street, there would be no signs because you wouldn't need them. Everything about the design of the street would tell you what the expected behavior is. And you wouldn't have people going through here at speeds that are unsafe because it would be physically impossible to do that. I'm optimistic about the future of this type of street in the North American context. I think we're, it's really a great tool for our spaces where we, we really want to create a uh, uh, a common space where all modes are, are welcome, but uh, you know, we clearly have a priority on placemaking over flow. So innovation is something that is really important. We're, at, we're having to always study, modify, adapt how we do things here in North America. Uh, one example is what's behind us. This is a, a particular kind of crossing treatment on a, on a busy arterial. So what is this place? What's special about this crossing? Right. Well, this is a flashing crosswalk. Um, the technical term for it is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, uh, but it's a mid-block crossing. It's a, a safer way for uh, people walking and biking. If they're looking to get across a busy street like this, they can come up and push a button, and then the strobe lights will activate, signaling to motorists that there is a pedestrian in the crosswalk. And this is a super highly effective way of getting people across where they need to be without people darting across the streets mid-block without any kind of device at all. And what's cool about this is that Boulder, um, along with some other communities, 
uh, more than 15 years ago, really co-invented this concept of doing these mid-plaque crossings and worked with the Federal Highways Administration to do an experimentation to launch this type of facility um, in, in our city. And so now we've got them basically everywhere and they work really well uh, to highlight the presence of a pedestrian or a cyclist in the crosswalk. So this is a great little alley access yeah. to, uh, to Pearl Street or downtown. It seems um, probably something that people would be using anyway were it not formalized, but it's been really thoughtfully designed yeah. and maintained and branded even. Beautified. Um, beautified. <laughs> and that's those kind of uh, details really make places work, right? Yes. Yeah. It's like uh, getting there is just much fun as being there. So we're, we're heading into the Boulder Creek Path, which is one of the most popular and heavily used parts of the Boulder's off-street network and the multi-use path system. And the off-street network is really the core it really is. of the mobility network. And it's a very uh, complete and, and attractive and comfortable facility. The multi-use path network, this is the foundation of cycling in, in Boulder. And the history of it is really fascinating. And, in that you know, it was back in the late 60s, early 70s, when uh, a bicycle pioneer, Al Bartlett, you know, really was inspired to create these places for people to ride their bikes without having any interaction with vehicles. They were thinking about children. One of the joys of getting around town, sometimes you do have to go out of your way just a little bit to get where you need to go, but riding on a multi-use path is just that fun, convenient, enjoyable place to ride your bike. <laughs> so in, in Dutch network planning, we talk about five core principles. Right. right. There's cohesiveness, which means continuous. Can, does it work seamlessly from, from plant point A to point B? There's comfort, which is not only physical comfort, but environmental comfort. Like, is there shade in the summer? Are, you know, is there sun in the winter? There's safety, which is not only direct safety in terms of traffic safety, but also social safety. Like, uh, do you feel comfortable being here after dark? That kind of, that kind of safety factors into that. Then we have uh, directness, very important. Right. Getting from where you want to go to where you want to be. And then attractiveness. And I think this facility just knocks it out of the park on attractiveness. Because the question I want to ask then is, you've got this amazing asset that really checks four out of those five boxes pretty well. The only one it doesn't really is directness. So how do you complete that network and hit all five of those principles uh, to make this an integrated part of the rest of the city? Well, they do say bicyclists travel like water. So I guess it's somewhat appropriate. They were following mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the following stream. Following the water. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, so again, you know, the, so the recreational value of these are fantastic. And then there's the indirect benefit to some degree for the transportation piece. You find a mix of both. Sometimes, well, you can actually recreate for your transportation trip and, uh, and, you know, find a fun way to go to get to where you need to be. So that said, recognizing that the multi-use paths aren't always the most direct, that's when you really got to understand the network and look at those connections from the multi-use path that connect to those high activity centers, those destinations, then prioritize those projects as saying, this is a critical path. This is a critical node to take you from this location onto the path to, you know, to create the overall low stress network. So this path and a lot of the network in Boulder follows our watersheds, which also happen to be uh, floodplains, That's right. our, our highest risk flood areas. So, so these paths aren't just for for transportation, mobility, and recreation, right? They have another important function, yeah. flood management, flood mitigation. That's right. Remember we talked about the partnerships with different departments mm -hmm. at, within the city. You know, we, there's a lot of funding in the, in the movement of water and drainage. And so a while back, that policy decision was made to say, when we're you know, moving these flood waters to the city, let's multi-purpose it. Let's create a, a, an avenue for people to walk and bike in a, in, you know, alongside of a river. And so it's that combination um, of you know resources at work and, and, and early policy setting 
that create, created this beautiful network that we have today with over 90 underpasses throughout that, the city. That's 90. amazing. Yeah. I know, that tells you like w when a city takes those steps, it really is prioritizing the safety of the community, flood prevention, and then also how people, the mobility, how people get around. So Zach, we're getting ready to come up to the, uh, the section of Folsom where we maintain the separated bike lane. And for a long time we had bollards, you know, separating the bike lane. And like many other cities, the city of Boulder also is looking at how do we harden that protection. And so we're moving from these bollards to adding these curb separated treatments. Now this is a cast in place curb right here. And a lot of, a lot of thought went into how these were manufactured and also how they were placed. As you can see, they're not centered. There's actually a little bit more room on the outside of the travel lane here to allow for snow removal and also that shy buffer space that um, motorists need for their vehicles as they're traveling down so they're not right up against the curb. But still, we, you know, three foot buffer in between there with a one foot wide curb separation, six inches tall. And then we add the bollards to the top which are inset inside that curb because when we do get those uh, snow events and you can't see the curb because it's covered with snow people still know there's something there. I think that's a really great example of how an interim project led to some tweaks and changes in the design of the final implementation right like that's one real benefit of yeah. of demonstration projects is you get to learn from them. Is this a model for future protected bike lanes in Boulder? And if so, like what's the, uh, what's kind of becoming institutionalized in terms of the design implementation of it? Well, I mean, as you know, like all contexts are different, right? And so there's, all, and there's many different ways in which you can create a, a separated bike lane or a protected bike lane. Whether you're using the planners like downtown or you're using curb separation here or you're putting a path behind a curb, you know, it all really depends on what the corridor study you've done is dictating because you went through a process to determine what kind of separation you do. And it also uh, determines the context of the street and also how much money you have to work with. Mm -hmm. And so if you are reconstructing a street and moving curb and gutter, you might look at some of those maintenance considerations and say, hey, it's better to have a walking path next to a multi-use path with a buffer in between, because if you're pushing snow around, then you want uh, one clean grade that you can work with to make that maintenance a lot easier. And so in this case here, we were really working with um, limited funds and something that we thought was going to be effective and so we did this uh, basically this cast in place so after we had resurfaced the road about oh, a month or two later we came in and, and put in the curb separation here so it was a combination of, you know, of our pavement management program resurfacing the road and then doing a mobility enhancement like this of hardening that protection from the bollard which was in that interim sort of experimental phase to a more permanent phase with the curb. That's a, that's a really good point, and I, I, I like how you're kind of uh, finding ways to sort of integrate your different existing programs to execute that hardening. Because yeah, we have a, a lot of um, early kind of implementations of protected bike lanes around the country, around the continent, that kind of need that. Having a strategy to go from that interim paint and ballers implementation to a permanent implementation should be part of every project from the beginning. Yes. We are here on Baseline Road with Melanie Sloan, the Principal Project Manager for City of Boulder. So looking at the network of Boulder and linking together all the different facility types that we have, what is the core arterial network and why is it so important to uh, make that integrated into the, the active transportation? Absolutely, that's a really great question. So the core arterial network, big thing off your tongue there, or can for short are a system of about 13 of our busiest streets in Boulder, where most of the vehicle travel as well as people are traveling. And why? Because it tends to be where most of our destinations are. Your businesses, restaurants, stores, schools, um, all kinds of destinations. Yeah, yeah, so there's a number of corridors that have been identified as, as uh, important priorities. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's this one behind us right now? Yeah, so as I said, start with 13. Well, we can't do all 13 at once. And so we prioritize three corridors to begin with. We have Baseline Road, Iris Avenue, and Folsom. 
starting first with Baseline Road, which we're standing in front of. Baseline Road is a key corridor both into our city and also within our region. So it has great transit service between us and neighboring communities that we know has um, you know, frequent service and only going to improve. We have student housing, which houses thousands of students at the University of Colorado, and a key transit connection up to both of the university's campuses. We also have marketplaces, businesses, restaurants, stores, grocery stores on either end. We have over 10 houses of worship. It's a key corridor. It fits the CAN description in almost every way you can think of. Boulder's got a Vision Zero Action Plan, like a lot of cities. Mm -hmm. How does the, the, the CAN priority support the Vision Zero Action Plan? Yeah, that's a great question because they are interlinked. The CAN initiative was really inspired. It inspired our Transportation Advisory Board, inspired our City Council to say, we are evaluating our streets. We're looking at traf traffic crashes and we're finding they keep occurring on these arterial streets. So the CAN is very much linked with Vision Zero. It's in us studying and evaluating and making changes to our transportation system to, so that we can reduce and eliminate those crashes that result in severe injury and fatality. So you're, you're using road design as a major strategy there to, mm -hmm. to, reduce, to improve safety on, on you know, busy high volume corridors like this. Yeah, like the example of hardening the bike lane. Uh, but there are other ways too, as we talked about the purpose of the CAN, making sure our intersections are safer and more comfortable to pass through. We know people look at the most difficult part of their journey and decide, am I going to take that on bike or foot or not? Intersections are key to that. That's where you're most vulnerable and exposed and how do we improve the intersections to reduce the potential for those severe crashes there. So let's talk about speed management. Uh, you know, if you're doing a safe systems approach, you're managing speeds because that is the number one factor in collision severity and, and frequency. So uh, some of your streets in your city are going to be naturally low speed and volume, but a lot of them aren't. Uh, so from a uh, design and, and operations perspective, how can you create conditions for speed, speeds to be safe? What do we do to address speeds? Because bigger roads can often lead to faster speeds. So how do we bring that in and it's balanced for everyone, whether they're walking or rolling? We know we have people in our communities with various mobility needs, right? So can you narrow lanes? That's pretty easy. Can you reallocate some space? Can you provide pedestrian crossings? Can, when you create crossings, can you elevate them? You're just thinking of a, a lot of different ways to use the roadway and some engineering to slow the vehicle down because speed limits and speed signs are only one tool and we have so many others that we can apply. And we know we have our leadership wanting us to do this and we have our public asking us to do this. And this is a story that is true in a lot of places around the, the, the country. It's encouraging to see, uh, I call it a trend now, of uh, default residential speed limits at 20 miles per hour, which Boulder now has. The important step is the engineering, and that's what we've learned from our Dutch colleagues, is that you really have to follow that with aggressive changes physically, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's not really a question of behavior, but a question of uh, just intuition, mm -hmm. and that the street itself tells you how to behave. So Absolutely. what are some of the uh, uh, design traits that you're looking at for, for corridors like this? Yeah, so as we look at our CAN corridors, we're looking broadly at um, things that have worked in other parts of our city, like we've talked about Folsom a little bit before. Uh, so that's a curb separated, a hardened bike lane. But then we're also looking at our pedestrian crossings. This corridor we stand on has a very long stretch with not a single crossing. And so how are people wanting to cross and where and spacing those appropriately to people's needs, but also to have that secondary influence of slowing vehicles down. Uh, we're also looking at our intersections. How do we design those? So when people are turning, they are slowing down and also providing greater visibility to those entering and moving through our, our intersections. So sometimes you've heard that as protected intersection elements. So we're looking at things like that as well. Really seeing a lot of innovation in North America on that, mm -hmm. on that front. It's exciting to see uh, our, our designs getting more and more sophisticated. Absolutely. When we look around at peer communities and see how people are hardening bike lanes or what are they doing at intersections, there's a lot to learn from each other. It's really a great time in transportation right now.